In a previous video, we looked at one way that you could model randomness on the blockchain using a block hash. But we saw that it was maybe a little bit hacky to implement, and you could tell that any kind of more complex computation is going to be hard to model with the limiting processing power that the EVM provides. So it might be useful to be able to perform certain types of computation off-chain and then simply relay the results back onto the chain when it's done. In fact, you might want to pull any kind of arbitrary data from the outside world and bring it onto the Ethereum chain and use it in your contracts. For example, if I wanted to make an insurance contract that says I will pay you 10 Ether if your flight is delayed, well, in that case, you're going to need a reliable way to know whether or not the flight was actually delayed in the outside world to be able to operate on that data in your contract code. And all of this is where the concept of an oracle comes in. So the Ethereum blockchain is its own source of truth. It encapsulates its own state and it knows absolutely nothing about the outside world and has no native way to communicate with it. So we are going to put an Oracle service in between the blockchain and the outside world and the Oracle service will be responsible for relaying data, relaying data in a consistent way from the outside world onto the chain. Now, an oracle is just an overarching concept. It is not specific to one individual implementation. There are multiple different ways that you can implement an oracle service, but they have the same general idea. So you cannot create a self-executing contract in Ethereum. Every contract call has to be triggered by an outside event. So if we wanna get some sort of data from the outside world, it's going to require us first calling into a contract on the chain. Now that contract is going to have hard coded into it knowledge of which Oracle service it wishes to use. So we can call into the contract, it will call out to the Oracle service. Now the Oracle service will be responsible for interopping with the outside world, getting whatever information it needs in a reliable way, and then formatting it into a consistent format. Now the Oracle service will then need to call back into the Ethereum blockchain. So it will likely call a callback function that's coded into that contract. Now this will happen at some point in the future. So it's very possible that the contract call that the Oracle makes into the contract is mined in a different block than the initial contract call we made to trigger the Oracle service. Now, we don't have to code these Oracle services from scratch. Fortunately, there are a couple good third-party libraries and tools that already exist for interopting with Oracles. A good one that I like to use is called Oracleize. And Oracleize is a third-party service that provides Oracle functionality for the Ethereum blockchain. So I'm going to now go and see how we could look at that coin flipper contract we wrote, but using randomness that's comp computed off-chain via a third-party service and then implemented back into that contract. Okay, so let's see what this looks like. I'm going to create a new file called coin flip Oracle, and this is going to be a new contract coin flip Oracle. And this contract is going to inherit from some library code from the Oracle I service that I'm going to add in a second. Um, it's also going to have a public string variable called result, where we're going to store the result of the coin flip. Either it's going to be the word heads or the word tails. It's also going to have a data format of bytes 32 public variable called Oracleiz ID. And there's gonna be two functions that we need to write in this Oracle contract. There's going to be a function called flip coin, which is what we're going to call to trigger the call to the Oracle service to actually flip the coin. And this function needs to be payable because we are going to need to send a little bit of ether with this function call to actually pay the Oracleize service to use it. And what this is going to do is it's going to call out to a function called Oracleize query. And we're gonna pass in some data to that. And this is going to return um, what eventually becomes the Oracleize ID. So we are going to call a function in our own contract that we send a little bit of ether to. Then we're gonna call out to the Oracleize query, which will be defined in the Oracleize library that we're going to add. And this will return an ID. Next, we're going to make a function called callback. So it's double underscore then callback. And this is gonna have two parameters. It's gonna have an argument that is the Oracleize ID and it's going to have a string, which is the result. And in here, we are just going to set the result equal to result. And the way that this works is this is the actual callback function that the Oracleize service will call on our contract. So it's gonna call it with two arguments. It's gonna call it with an Oracleize ID and the result string. 
Now the Oracleize ID is good to have because it's very possible we could call this four or five times or you could call to an Oracle service multiple times and then when the callback is fired, you want to know which specific request to the service is actually getting called back. So you can check against the ID to see um, how you can handle the logic that way. Okay, so now let's write that Oracleize query function. If I go to docs.oracleize.it, I can find documentation for the entire Oracleize service. I encourage you to go ahead and read through this whole thing, but the part that we need is right here with the Oracleize query function. Now, Oracleize query is going to take two arguments. The first is a data source, and the second is a data input string. Now, the default data source is URL which just lets you pass a URL in and Oracleize will return the, whatever data it gets from that URL. Now, you can also pass it a JSON parse string. So you can say, I want to interpret this URL response as JSON data, and I want to parse it with this line of JavaScript. And then whatever result you get from that parse, call back to my function with that. So that's really useful whenever you want to get a JSON API. Now, Oracleize also has default integrations with a variety of different services. For example, it has default integration with IPFS hashes or with Wolfram Alpha, which is a computational knowledge engine, which lets you compute based on natural language searches. For example, flipping a coin, Wolfram Alpha could be a great integration because we can just tell it to flip a coin and it'll just give us a string as the result. So I'm going to go to Wolfram Alpha just to test this out and do flip a coin. And we can see that it does return. In this case, it returns tails, but this will just do a 50-50 coin flip and give us the result. So if we want to integrate with Wolfram Alpha, all we need to do is tell Oracleize to use the Wolfram Alpha service and then the search and then the search string. So let's go back to our thing and Oracleize query will tell it to use Wolfram Alpha. And then we'll give it the string flip a coin. And that's all that we need to do there. Next, I need to add the code from the Oracleize service. I'm just going to paste in this code right here, but you can find this online, where if for some reason you can't, I will add it to the show notes as well. And then I need to tell the CoinFlip Oracle contract to inherit from the using Oracleize contract, because that's the contract that Oracleize is expecting you to inherit from to have the right functionality where you get things like Oracleize query. Um, one other thing that I want to do also is right now, the way that this contract is set up, anybody could call this callback function. But really, you only want this callback function to be called from the Oracleize service. So I'm just going to add a little bit of code that says, if message.sender is not equal to Oracleize underscore CB address, then just throw. So this will basically prevent anybody from calling into that contract unless it's the Oracleize service itself. And now I'm going to deploy this onto the test net so we can actually see this interaction play out in a live environment. So I'm going to copy this code and I'm going to go to the online Solidity compiler at ethereum.github.io slash browser dash Solidity. I'm going to make a new file. I'm just going to paste in that code and I'm going to hit compile. And it's going to give me the bytecode of the contract and the ABI. Then I can go to myetherwallet.com and use their open source web UI in order to just deploy this contract. So I'm going to go to contracts and then deploy contract. And it's going to ask me first to access my wallet by entering my private key. Now, I just made a private public key pair that I'm going to use for the purposes of this demo. But I sent a thousand test ether into the account. So anyone that is watching this can just go ahead and use this private key and public key, which is also in the show notes, and test it. Just don't you know, steal all the ether. That would be mean. So I'm going to paste in the private key. And just make sure that you set the endpoint here to the Ropstin beta, which is the test net of the Ethereum network. So I'm going to unlock my wallet here. And then I'm going to go back to the Solidity compiler. I'm going to copy the bytecode, and I'm going to paste that in. And then it's going to try to calculate the amount of gas that it needs in order to deploy this contract, but I'm going to give it a lot more than that. I'm actually going to give it 2 million, just because I think that this contract will actually take a lot more gas to deploy. These gas estimates are never right, and this UI is a little wonky how it keeps like overwriting it, but I would just set this to 2 million for deploying the contract, and you should be all right. Now I'm going to hit, next I'm going to hit deploy contract. And yes, I am sure that I want to deploy this contract. And great, it's going to give me a hash, a TX hash of the deployed contract onto the testnet. And it looks like the contract has been mined. The contract has been created. The gas used was almost a million, so we were a little conservative there. Um, we can click on this and we can look at the contract. So here it is. Our contract is deployed. Now let's actually call into that contract to try and flip the coin. Okay, so I'm going to open up my node console 
calling out to the decipher.js file. And I, I configured this decipher.js file to connect to the testnet via Infura, and you can see the exact configuration I'm using in the show notes. But I'm going to set var contract equal to web3.f.contract, and I need to pass in the ABI, which I can get from the Solidity compiler right here. And I'm going to paste that in. And then I can get the deploy contract by doing var deployed equals contract.at and then going back to etherscan and grabbing the contract address. So now I have access to the deployed contract on the testnet. And I should be able to do deploy.result.call and see an empty string because there's nothing there. All that we've done is initialize it. We haven't called out to the Oracleized service yet. Now I'm going to go back to myetherwallet.com slash contracts and refresh the page. And I'm going to go down the pathway that lets me interact with the contract instead of deploying it. So let me get the contract address here and paste that in. And then let me go back to the Solidity compiler and get the ABI and paste that in and click access. And it's going to know about all the different functions that we can call. In this case, we just want to call the flip coin function. And we're going to use that same private key that we used before, which I have to go grab here. And we're going to click unlock our wallet. And now we're going to write that transaction. Now it's going to ask us how much ether that we want to send with this contract call. Remember, we have to pass a little bit of ether for the Oracle I service to work. And you can read about more about how their pricing and gas limits work in their documentation. But we're just going to send one ether for now so that we don't need to worry about this. And I'm just going to set this to 3 million so I don't need to worry about that and click generate transaction. So this gives me an example of the transactions. It refreshes because the UI is a little wonky, but I'm just going to do it again. And now I'm going to click yes, I am sure, make transaction. So now we're actually calling to the Oracle I service and we get a transaction hash here. And let's, so this is the transaction that we just sent, but let's go back to the contract and look at this also. Okay, and we see something very interesting here. We see this call that we made 45 seconds ago. And if we look at the TX hash, we'll see that it actually knows that this is calling the flip coin function and this has one ether sent with it. So this is the contract call that we instantiated. But there's also another function call that came 35 seconds after hours that we did not instantiate. And if we look at it, we can see that this is actually the Oracle service calling our callback function into the contract. Um, and that's really cool. So it looks like the Oracle service actually did make a transaction into our contract. And if we go ahead and go to our UI and click deploy.result.call, we see that we actually get the word tails. So it looks like the Oracle service did call into Wolfram Alpha, have it flip a coin, and then call back into our function with the result tails, which is now stored in our contract, and now we could operate over. So that's like a quick, quick overview of Oracle It's a very cool service. I highly encourage you to play around with it. It's very useful.